Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Good evening all of you, my subject is insurance law and uh, this is my fourth lecture that is the principles of insurance. I am Dr. Naresh Mahipal, Senior Assistant Professor from Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. Previously we have discussed about the origin, about the historical development of insurance law and thereafter we have discussed fundamental basic principles of the life insurance. So, discussing all those concepts, nature of the insurance, origin and historical development, let us come to the principles of insurance. That what are the basic principles on the basis of which insurance contract is formed. In my today's topic, we will discuss about the principles of insurance, what are the basic principles of insurance, what are the general principles of insurance, what are specific or contractual principles and what are the miscellaneous principles. All these principles are important to form the insurance contract. I am talking about general thing that is the insurance contract not about the life insurance or about the general insurance. It is all type of insurances. These principles are applicable over. Let us discuss it one by one. The very first thing is about the principles of insurance. It is noteworthy that contract of insurance is based on the insurance and specifically involves general principles and specific or contractual principles. In India, most of the aspects of contract of insurance are governed by the Indian Contract Act 1872. Additionally, that insurance contract should further comply with the provisions of Insurance Act 1938, Comprehensive Provisions of Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority 1999 and the Indian Stamp Act 1899, Income Tax Act 1961 and Hindu Succession Act 1956. These all laws are primarily important because it contains something about the insurance, about the insurance policies. But primarily when it comes to the formation of any contract, maybe it is your insurance contract or maybe any kind of contract, generally the insurance contract is governed by the Indian Contract Act. But these all laws should be in addition to and not in derogation to this insurance contract act you can say. Now principles of insurance can be classified into four approaches namely basic principles there are certain basic principles on the basis of which contract of insurance can be entered into. There are certain general principles which are to be followed to enter into an insurance contract. There are certain specific or contractual principles. These are certain contractual principles, these are sub specific principles which must be followed for entering into any insurance contract. And there are certain miscellaneous principles which must be observed while entering into any insurance contract. Let us discuss it one by one that what are those basic principles, what are those general principles and what are the specific principles and what are the others miscellaneous principles which are to be followed while entering into any contract of insurance. The very first one is basic principles. There are two aspects of basic principles. Number one is principle of cooperation. Insurance is considered as a cooperative device because 
the loss suffered by one person is shared by a group of persons who collectively puts the premium in a common pool. We have already discussed it with an example that you are paying some premium amount to get a better coverage for that. And in the case of loss or, or a loss to a life or loss to any property or to your car etc. In that situation you will get what has been assured to you by way of policy documents. To accumulate funds and charging from the members is done by the insurance company or insurer to pay them at the happening of the insured risk. Every person who wish to join the scheme of insurance gives a premium in advance. In this way, the insurer cooperates to those members who happen to suffer a loss. The loss is borne by the insurance company on the basis on the strength of the shoulders of the those insured persons who came on a common platform, they came through a common pooling that is called the premium amount. Another aspect of the principle is that theory of probability. This is very important aspect. Here the theory of probability is used to calculate the amount of premium. How the premium is calculated? It is not like that you are looking 5 feet then you will be given charged more and if you are of 8 feet then you will be charged less or more you can say. That is not the aspect. But there are certain uh, few aspects which are used to calculate the amount of premium such as age, such as your working profile, such as your salary, such as your uh, place of living. These are important, your health issues. These all are the factors which will determine the payment of premium. Since the probability of loss depends on many factors, the companies collect the data of instances of previous years to analyze the probability of incidence in present and future conditions. This is how the companies keep working and collecting the data that what are those factors which should be laid stress and the which are those factors on the basis of which they were required to pay more. So they will analyze the, those factors and this is through the theory of probability. The theory of probability tells the idea that what are the chances of loss and what will be the amount of loss. The premium cannot be calculated without the help of theory of probability. So the insurance companies always work on the theory of probability. They always find out that what are those factors through which the loss will occur many times and what should be the premium rate at that time and whether they should abstain from issuing such kind of policy in such circumstances or not or if yes then what the premium amount should be taken from the person and from whom these all are the factors calculated by the companies before fixing the amount of premium and that is done through the theory of probability. The goal of the theory of probability is to use statistical or mathematical techniques to identify patterns for the occurrence of different kinds of events. This theory is used to calculate the different kinds of events and this method is used by insurance companies to create and set the cost of policies. This is what I am discussing with you while going through these factors that what is your age, what is your policy, place of living, what is your salary, uh, what is your chances, what is your uh, about the health condition of you, about the health condition of family members, about your hereditary conditions, about your existing pre-existing diseases. These all things will help the companies to create and the cost of policies. For example, let us clear it more with an example. When it comes to health insurance, a smoker's coverage is probably going to cost more than a non-smoker because expectancy of life of a non-smoker is more than the smoker. That is why the smoker has to pay more for the insurance policy. Statistics indicate that those who smoke regularly or have a history of smoking are more strongly associated with a number of health hazards. 
the financial risk of insuring a smoker is higher for the company due to their increased likelihood of developing a major sickness and consequently of making a claim. So this is how what I am discussing with you various factors will be determined those will be seen for calculating the premium of the policy that is to be issued such as your health condition if you are unhealthy if you are having some predetermined health issues obviously there are more chances that in future you are more likely to develop a major sickness other than the fit person who is uh, not smoking or who is fit at that particular position the chances are high that you will be more susceptible to those unhealthy conditions or the sickness at very early stage so the premium amounts will be calculated according to that in the field of mathematics known as probability theory the goal is to predict random events by looking at vast volumes of previous similar events in statistics probabilities are the mathematical likelihood that an event will occur a probability ratio is obtained by dividing the number of favorable results in a set by the total number of possible results in the set this is how they use the probability theory in the mathematical way by using the stats the likelihood that an event will occur is expressed by the probability ratio this ratio is very vital to insurance firms considering all the factors your age group your health conditions your living condition your salary the your family history your pre existing diseases going through all these stats the company will form an opinion on the basis of the result that come through those particular sets so this ratio is very vital to insurance companies to determine the premium amount whether the policy should be issued to you or not to which age group the policy should be issued and what premium is to be charged thereafter the companies keep on going with this type of statistical datas and this is called your theory of probability which is very vital to the insurance firms to decide the insurance premium next type of uh, principles are your general principles there are certain general or the fundamental principles of contract under the section 10 of indian contract act that they are applied on all kinds of contracts in my previous lecture i have discussed these basic principles for the formation of life insurance contract now we will talk about these general principles for the formation of any kind of contract maybe it is life insurance or maybe it is your general insurance or maybe the reinsurance these principles are offer and acceptance legal consideration competency or capacity to contract free consent legal object and limitation of time these uh, principles are very important then these are very fundamental to form any insurance contract let us discuss it one by one the general principles number 1 is offer and acceptance like all other contracts a contract of insurance is also concluded through offer and acceptance the people who wish to get insured intends to buy the policy and makes the offer and the other party who is ready to assume the risk stated is called as acceptance means the general public makes the offer reading your documents it will make you the the offer to the company and if the company is ready to assume the risk it will accept the offer of you in case of insurance offer is called as proposal also if other party accepts the proposal other party means the insurance company or the insurer if it accepts your proposal it is converted into an agreement and that agreement becomes contract if all other aspects are followed that there should be lawful object there is a free consent these all are other aspects that must be fulfilled 
to make this agreement as a valid contract. Let us make this uh, offer and acceptance more clear with some illustrations. The first example is an offer is given by the insurance company to the proposer that the annual premium for rupees 1000 in insurance would be rupees 100 means you will be insured for rupees 1000 and you have to pay rupees 100 as the premium the proposer has the option to accept or reject the offer still it is not concluded as an agreement you are making a proposal to the company and contra the company says that you have to pay 1000 rupees instead of 500 rupees to get the benefit in that situation it is up to you that is the proposer that is the offerer to accept or reject the offer if you accept that proposal then it becomes an agreement another example is an invitation to make an offer is contained in a newspaper advertisement describing the various life insurance plans that are available an application submitted by a proposer is an offer from the applicant which the insurance company may accept or reject this is another a good example which we can discuss that in newspaper they we get some news about the an advertisement about any insurance policy I have gone through that insurance policy, their conditions and everything that we have gone through and I am ready to get it. I am making a proposal to the company, offer to the company to issue me such policy. Now it is up to the company to accept or reject the proposal. If the company accepts, you cannot claim that you have put an advertisement in the newspaper. So the policy must be issued to me. No, you will make the proposal that I have read the advertisement. Uh, in the or the news in the newspaper and I am ready to purchase the policy. I am ready to abide by the terms and conditions whatever has been mentioned in the advertisement or the newspaper. In that situation the company has to decide whether it accepts your proposal or it may reject the proposal. You cannot claim it as a matter of right. Another example is when the applicant say, pays the first premium or the insurance firm provides the policy the offer is deemed accepted. What it means? When you have paid the first premium and on the basis of that premium, the company has issued you the policy documents, the offer is deemed to be accepted and the company is legally bounded to act upon. The company has been considered to be entered into a insurance contract with you. In insurance contracts, the offer or proposer and its acceptance must be made in writing though in other conditions that may be made in verbally uh, the law of contract permits that oral contracts are also contracts but in insurance contract when it comes specifically to insurance contract you are required to make the offer and acceptance in writing in general insurance the insured makes an offer to the insurer to buy insurance. This offer is made in the form of a proposal which the insurer may accept or reject after reviewing it. He sends out a cover note or a letter of acceptance if he accepts it. In the latter case that is the rejection, the acceptance letter transforms into a counter offer or proposition that the insured accepts in exchange for premium payment. So, this is very important aspect about the offer and acceptance that whatever you are, if you are filling any policy document, you are trying to get a policy and it has been sent to the company and along with that document you have paid the premium amount that does not conclude the contract. It is just an offer from your side when the company or the insurer reads it, underwrites it and issues you the policy document only then the contract is completed the insurance complete comes into at that time another important aspect of the principle or the principle is legal consideration in a contract of insurance the insured gives 
premium as a consideration in return of which insurer undertakes to pay a certain amount at a specified contingency maybe it is your life insurance maybe it is your general insurance maybe it is your reinsurance the insurer makes a promise that he will pay you in the happening of certain event when i say certain event it means the event is to be calculable that is very determined predetermined that on happening of certain things the company will be liable to pay you such amount for that and to get that particular contract the insured pays a premium at the regular intervals for that it must not be money but maybe rights sums profit interest or benefit these all things can be issued by the insurer to you value of amount of premium is not important what is important is that premium has been given as consideration to ensure the liability of insurer this is very important what value you have given for the consideration it is not of that much matter what is matter important is that the premium has been given as a consideration amount i told you that without consideration there is no valid contract in that situation when it comes to your insurance contract a contract cannot becomes legal without consideration which is an act of promise made by one party and acknowledged by the other as payment for that promise consideration is very important as well the premium that the insured pays the insurer in exchange for the insurer's guarantee to indemnify the insured is known as the consideration in insurance contracts therefore the insured's payment of premiums represents their consideration and the insurer's commitment to indemnify represents their consideration another important aspect is competency or capacity to contract again it is very essential element of contract of insurance the parties must be competent to enter into a contract when i say contract it is a contract of insurance maybe it is any other contract because we are governed by the law of contract so the party must be competent to enter into the agreement into that particular contract every person is said to be competent to enter into a contract who is of the age of majority according to the law and who is of sound mind and who is not disqualified from contracting by any law to which he is subject of however a person who is not competent to contract can still be beneficiary of the contract with the help of the provisions of section 11 of the indian contract act so we have already discussed about the competency or capacity of contract with the help of mori bibi case also that uh, even if a minor is not uh, in a capacity to contract is not competent to contract still he can be beneficiary of the contract so a minor can enter into an insurance contract with the company with their parents or the guardians help at that time and he may be the beneficiary of such provisions of those particular policy in terms of the insurer it can enter into an agreement if the business is authorized to solicit insurance and was established in accordance with national legislation regarding the insured the individual must be of sound mind and of legal age which is 18 years old these are the competency or the capacity to the, to the contract that person should not be of unsound mind and he should be on a of a valid age that is your 18 years to enter into the contract of insurance if a minor enters into a contract and then decides to renounce it in that situation what if he has entered into a insurance contract with the company and then he decides to renounce it 
to repudiate it, the application may be deemed unenforceable. As long as the minor wants to continue the insurance agreement, the insurer is obligated to fulfill its end. The minor is legally entitled to a refund of the entire premium amount if he repudiates his contract. The formation of a legally binding insurance contract is prohibited by insanity or mental incompetence also. So if a minor enters into contract and he wants to repudiate it, the insurance company is liable to refund the entire premium amounts if he has decided to repudiate his contract. Similarly, if any contract is entered into uh, by some insane person, mentally incompetent person or due to the insanity in that situation the company is liable to insurer is liable to pay you the entire amount of the sum uh, that has been given by way of premium another important aspect is free consent when both parties to the contract agreed to and willing to abide by the terms and conditions of contract in the same sense and same spirit they are said to have a free consent to elaborate more free consent means when the consent is not obtained through coercion through any undue influence through mistake through misrepresentation or any fraud. So, when the consent is free, it is out of own vocation, it is out of own free will. At that situation, we can say that it is a free consent by the both parties and the contract, the agreement becomes the valid contract in that situation. And if the both parties are mistakenly entering into any policy in that situation, it is not termed to be free consent at that. So, it means that both parties should understand the insurance agreement or the contract in the same sense and the same spirit. What has been written or what has been mentioned or what has been asked the insurer and the insurer insured to do in that situation. Another important aspect is legal object. Obviously, the object of the contract should not be unlawful. I have already previously discussed with you that it should be lawful for any unlawful activity that is barred by law, you can say you cannot enter into any contract. So, object of the contract may be that is insurance policy, it should be the unlawful, it should not be unlawful. As per section 23 of the Indian Contract Act, the object is unlawful, which is forbidden by law, which is immoral, which is opposed to public policy or which defeats the provision of any law. These all objects are said to be unlawful, that it should not be forbidden by law or it should not be for any immoral activity or it should not be opposed to any public policy. Then we can say that the contract is for some legal or lawful object and then you can enter into any agreement or the contract. For example, when we talk about the lawful object or the legal, uh, legal uh, aspects, one can accept life insurance for themselves or their loved ones. It will not be a legitimate contract if someone takes out an insurance on the life of an unknown individual because it would be a gambling. I do not know you and what if I get an insurance policy for you, when I do not know you about your health, about your age, about your salary, about your family condition, about anything. What if I get any insurance policy for you, this is not for some something legal that is acceptable in any contract. It can only be taken for your own and for your own loved ones. Loved ones when I say it could be your labor, it could be your son or daughter or whatever may be. 
but those should be associated with you in some or other forms at that time. One more example I would like to quote that a contract pertaining to an illicit action or stolen goods will not be enforceable. I have made a contract with you to steal something. You have stolen that property and now you are asking for the payment. That is not a valid contract. Therefore, contracts pertaining to insurance of stolen goods or smuggling operations will be null and invalid and will not be subject to legal investigations. So, the policy should be very much clear. It should be very lawful. It should not be forbidden by law. It should not against the government or the legal policies that are framed by the governments. Only then any insurance contract entered between the parties can be said that it is a valid insurance contract. Third type of principles that we will discuss are specific or contractual definitions. When I say specific or contractual definitions, it's uh, principles. It means that these principles uniformly apply to all variety of insurances. All variety of insurance means uniformly apply to all variety of insurance. It means that maybe it is your life insurance, maybe it is your general insurance or reinsurance. These certain specific or contractual principles have significant paramount importance. These are very paramountly significant over the any contract, maybe it is your insurance contract. So, these principles are discussed as under, we will discuss it one by one also. The very first one is you bear him a fights, at most good faith. This is very important and very popular type of specific principle that has been discussed many times. You bear him a fights, that is at most good faith. The second one is insurable interest. The third one is principle of causa proxima and the fourth one is principle of indemnity and the fifth one is principle of subrogation. We will discuss these contractual principles or to say specific principles one by one. Another specific principle is Juberima fights that is good faith. Every contract of insurance is based on mutual trust and faith. It is a contract of most good faith that is Verima fights. According to this principle, the insured must disclose all material facts and should not make any misrepresentation because this contract is of utmost good faith on both the parties. The insured must not keep anything disclosed which is a very difficult for the insurer to determine the insurance policy and that situation you should not give any miss uh, information or you should not hide any information that must be provided to the insurer. In Bajaj Alliance Life Insurance Company versus Dalbir Corp, very landmark judgment which has been recently decided in 2020, Apex Court observed that a contract of insurance is one of utmost good faith and a proposer who seeks to obtain a policy of life insurance is duty bound to disclose all the material facts. So, this is very important that it is duty of the insured person or you can say the proposer, it is duty of the proposer to make all the material facts to the in the knowledge of the insurer to obtain a policy because this contract this proposal and acceptance these are of utmost good faith both should give the clear information accurate information to each other similarly in the year 2019 previous to that in reliance life insurance company limited versus Rekha Ben Naresh Bhai, it was held by the Supreme Court of India that failure of the insured to disclose the policy of insurance obtained 
earlier in the proposal form entitled the insurer to repudiate the claim under the policy. If there is a column in the proposal form issued by the company to be filled by you that is the insured. If there is a column which is asking about the previous insurance policy and you are not making any thing about any information any disclosure about those informations the company is in a option to repudiate the claim under that policy because this contract is of utmost good faith where all the material facts should be disclosed by the proposer or the insurance company also in 2019 itself in oriental insurance company versus mahindra construction it was held by division bench of supreme court that it was a plain duty of the respondent while making the proposal to make a clear and specific disclosure over and over i am pointing towards the duty aspect that it is the plain duty of the respondent that is the proposer while making the proposal to make a clear and specific disclosure whatever has been asked you by the insurance company that must be disclosed in an ambiguous language in a very clear term to the insured company to the insurer so that they can determine whether the policy should be accepted or rejected to you issued to you or not in that sense so the principle of utmost good faith defines the duty of proposer that all the material facts should be disclosed voluntarily voluntarily means out of own free will in true and full whether asked or not whatever has been asked to you that should be provided in your form and in addition if you want to give any other information to the insurance company you are supposed to make those informations in the proposal form that will be seen by the insurer on the basis of those informations only the insurance company insurer will be in a position to determine whether the policy should be issued or not although there is a principle the principle of caveat emptor that is the let the buyer beware it applies to the majority of commercial contracts there is no requirement to divulge anything that is not requested under these contracts we are discussing that you must mention all those things maybe it has not been asked by the insurance contract right insurance contracts are distinctive in that sense that they are predicated on the information that the insured party knows they are not asking you that what may happen to you only the company is asking about your incidents that what are the problems with you what are your salaries etc maybe there is a column or not if you want to disclose anything you can do so because it is only predetermined you are they are not asking for any future event of that additionally the law imposes an obligation of bona fides or utmost good faith anyone seeking insurance must provide all pertinent informations in accordance with the concept of the highest good faith that is the utmost good faith you must provide all the pertinent all the required all the essential informations in accordance with the concept of verima fights a contract may be voidable in cases where material non disclosure can be demonstrated if you are not disclosing any material fact which you are supposed to disclose maybe it has been asked or not here the principle of caveat emptor will not apply you are supposed to mention all those material facts which are within your knowledge in order to establish the insurer to issue you policy or not because on the basis of your declaration on the basis of your informations that you are providing the insurer is in a better position to determine whether the policy should be issued or rejected 
or if issued on what conditions. So, this is considered to be a very important obligation that is the uberime of fides or the utmost good faith. Another specific principle is insurable interest, very important aspect. It is another necessary aspect to validate an insurance policy. It is presumed that every contract entered into is enforceable by the parties to it provided it is not illegal, it is not immoral or contrary to the public policies. So, this is very important that these contracts are only enforceable when it is not against the policy or it is not illegal or it is not immoral. The insurable interest means an interest that insured must possess in the subject matter of the insurance and which can be protected by a contract of insurance. You must show what is your interest in that policy. You are father, you have interest in the life of your son, you have interest in the education of your son, you are interested in the marriage of your daughter, you are interested in the education of your daughter, you are interested in the life of your daughter, similarly the wife and vice versa. You, have, you must have some insurable interest. Similarly, an employer must have insurable interest in the life or the working conditions of the employees. So, you must have interest in the subject matter of the insurance. For example, let us make it more clear with an example. The owner of a taxi has an insurable interest in the vehicle since it generates revenue for him. We know that how much a taxi is important or a cab is important for a driver. He would not have an insurable stake in the taxi cab though if he sells it. If you sell the taxi or that cab, he is not having an insurable interest in that. He cannot take the policy for that because he has loosened his right, he has loosened his interest over that particular policy. We can infer from the example above that ownership is a significant factor in determining an insurable interest. Ownership does not mean that the father is having ownership of the relationships that is son or the daughter or the wife, but you must have some substantial direct connection with that particular relation. Each person's interest in their own life is insurable. Obviously, you are interested in your own life also. So, you can take the life insurance policy of your own. You are interested in your property, you can take the property insurance. You are interested in your vehicle, you can take the vehicle policy for that. A merchant's interest in his trade firm is insurable. A merchant is having interest in his trade, obviously is in his business, then it is insurable. In the same way, a creditor's interest in his debtor is insurable. A creditor may insure his debtors that in the event of some mishappening, if some mishappening happened to the debtor, the creditor can get that particular amount from the insurer. So, this is very important aspect. Now, the next specific or the contractual principle is principle of causa proxima. Again, very important principle that is proximate cause, very important factor to determine the insurance contract. The doctrine of proximate cause is expressed in the maxim causa proxima non remota spectator, which means that the proximate and not the remote cause shall be taken into account as the cause of loss. It is another important principle of insurance. It lies down that proximate cause that is the nearest cause is to be the basis of determining the liability of the insurer and not the remote cause. If the immediate cause of loss is insured, the insured will be indemnified. 
very landmark judgment which was delivered in 1890 pink versus fleming the proximate cause has been clearly explained by the queens bench fact of the case was that in a marine policy the cargo was a shipment of oranges and the peril insured was the collision with another ship the ship collided with another ship and resulted in delay and mishandling of shipment due to the delay and mishandling of the shipment oranges became unfit for human consumption it was held that the proximate cause for the loss was the delay and mishandling of the shipment and not the collision the proximate cause was at that situation was the delay not the collision therefore insurer was not liable for the damages as the peril insured was the collision itself so this is how we can determine that what is the proximate cause in that situation principle of causa proxima is not maintainable to life insurance the insurer is bound to pay in case of death of insured maybe it is proximate cause or not if death happens insurer is liable to pay the amount that is promised insurance to his nominee or the legal representatives the proximate results whether natural or unnatural directly or indirectly are immaterial how the death happened that is immaterial direct or you can say indirectly natural or unnatural these all are immaterial however there is a exception to this rule and in the following cases this principle is observed in the life insurance also there are certain exemption clause when this uh, proximate cause will not apply to the life insurance policies number 1 is accident the difficulty arises when accident policy insured is killed or suffers an injury which has a proximate as well as a remote cause in accident benefit insurance twice the amount insured is paid so to determine the real and actual cause of death in these cases become highly important for the insurer that is the company there is a thin line difference between death and injuries caused due to natural or accidental causes one may escape from the infections of jaundice another comes one person may die due to any disease and other may get uh, out of that particular disease so the disease or death occurring due to cold hot climate change and atmospheric change cannot be said to be due to accident these are not accidents another exempted clause in any life insurance policy is which cannot be considered to be proximate cause is suicide if the insured commits suicide within one year of the policy or intends to commit suicide the payment of policy amount would be restricted only up to the interest of the third party provided the interest was expressed at least one month before the commission of suicide very important thing in previously when any person commits suicide maybe is a regular payer of the premium amount for so many years the a policy was not covering the suicide aspect the insurer denies the premium amount or other benefits to the nominees or to the legal representatives but now the situation has changed at if the insurer commits suicide within one year of the policy or if he shows his intention to commit the suicide within the one year of the policy he is not entitled to get anything another aspect is war risk if the policy is issued on the condition of excluding death arising out from war risk this principle becomes important because the insurance companies waive their liability how in india this principle is ignored and full payment of policy is handed over to the legal representatives of the insured killed due to the war it the policies are matters of the different states different countries so uh, in india this is the position that we give the amount full benefit of the policy if any person dies in the 
war etc another specific principle of contract is principle of indemnity all insurance contracts except life insurance are contract of indemnity the loss due to loss of life cannot be measured in the terms of money therefore the insurer undertakes to pay a fixed amount in such kind of contingency similarly accident and illness insurance also comes to an exception to the principle of indemnity in simple words indemnity is a promise from insurer side to compensate the actual loss the assured is entitled to be indemnified to the extent he suffers a loss or damage not the entire value of the property insured the principle of indemnity states that the sole purpose of signing an insurance policy is to obtain protection against unforeseen financial losses brought on by unknown future events an insurance contract's only goal is to provide compensation in the event of harm or loss it is not intended for financial gain thus insurance has no financial purpose other than providing protection against losses the principle of indemnity does not however apply in the cases of life insurance since the worth of a human life cannot be measured in monetary terms let us take an example a house was insured for rupees 5 lakh against a fire insurance policy due to fire the insured suffered a loss of rupees 50000 in actual here the insurer is liable to pay actual loss that is rupees 50000 only and not the policy amount of rupees 5 lakh in case where the insured suffered loss due to wrongful act of a third party and if he receives compensation from the wrong doer for total loss his claim against the insurer is abated there is another important principle specific principle that is principle of subrogation the principle of subrogation is supplementary to the principle of indemnity in simple words insurance steps into the shoes of the insured it is not applicable to life insurance once the insured is compensated for loss or damage the insurer stands in place of him and inherits all the rights available to him against the third party regarding subject matter of the insurance also insurer cannot recover the claim from third party more than the sum paid out of the insured principle of subrogation cannot be limited to recovery after compensation is paid this right may be exercised by the insurer against the third party before payment of loss until and unless the insurer is fully paid his right to control over and any such proceedings another specific principles are miscellaneous principles there are certain miscellaneous principles regarding insurance those are principles of contribution principles of return of premium legal principles and auxiliary principles let us see one by one principle of contribution means it comes into play where there are two or more insurance on one risk the aim of contribution is to call upon the different insurers to distribute the actual amount of loss who are liable for the same peril under different policies in respect of the same subject matter so we can say that right of contribution arises when there are different policies covering the same subject matter the policies cover the same peril which caused the loss all the policies are in the force at the time of loss one of the insurers has paid to the insured more than his share of loss another one is principle of return of premium generally the premium once paid cannot be asked to be refunded not even when the insured is unable to enforce his insurance policy however to the rule certain exceptions further classified have been laid down in which the refund is allowed that is return of part premium and in certain conditions return of total premiums third one is legal principles insurance is a contract where a certain or ascertainable sum of money is paid to the insured in consideration of insurers incurring the risk on the happening of certain contingency therefore the provisions of contract act apply on such contracts other enactments like specific relief act law of limitation 
Indian Stamp Act, Succession Act, Estate Duty Act, Transfer of Property Act are also applicable. Then lastly, principles are auxiliary principles. These could be further classified into contract of indemnity, contract of adhesion, conditional contract, aleatory contract and unilateral contracts. So, we can conclude that through this lecture, we have came to know that what are the principles of insurance, what are the basic principles of insurance, what are the general principles of insurance, what are the specific or contractual principles of insurance and what are the miscellaneous principles. I am sure that through this uh, video, you must have been knowledgeable of the principles that are followed in formation of any insurance contract. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. Perhaps the most popular literary genre after novel is the short story. Sharp, compact narratives whose charm lies not only in what is said, but also in what remains unsaid. Today I will be reading one of the shortest instances of a short story that I have ever encountered. And Indeed, the very charm of this particular story that I am going to read out today lies in the way it abruptly ends. It is an ancient tale from Mesopotamia which has been retold by several authors among whom the name of Somerset Mom stands out. Uh, the adaptation that I will be reading out is perhaps the closest to the one that Mom wrote. The story is titled in all of its adaptations almost as Appointment in Samara. Here is the story. A merchant in Baghdad once sent one of his servants to the market. The servant was supposed to buy provisions for the merchant, but when he returned, he came back empty handed. Indeed, the servant had all gone white and trembling with fear, he told his master that he had met death in the marketplace. When I entered the market, the servant said to his master, I was jostled by a woman and when I turned to look at her, I saw that she was death. I am very scared, master, because death looked at me with a threatening gesture. Can you please lend me your horse so that I can fly away from Baghdad to the town of Samara and thereby escape death? The master, being a good man, gave his servant his best horse and saw him gallop off to Samara to escape death. Then the master himself went to the marketplace and confronted death. Why did you make a threatening gesture to my servant? Asked the master to death. And death replied, it was not a threatening gesture. Rather, it was a start of surprise. I was astonished to see your servant here today because this evening, I have an appointment with him in Samara. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippet.